Welcome to episode 26 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm going to be interviewing Danny Manis. Danny has worked as a development executive for many years and now runs his own script consulting business, No Bull Script Consulting. We talk specifically about some of the movies he's worked on and how the production companies he worked for found and hired those writers. So stay tuned for that. I'd like to thank this episode's sponsor, ScreenCraft. ScreenCraft is dedicated to helping screenwriters master the craft of screenwriting and succeed in the business of Hollywood. Sign up for free education and inspiration at ScreenCraft.org. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast or on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. Those social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast. I'd like to thank David Doerr, Thomas Ryan, Jason Levy, Stanford Crane, Ginger Shine, Badea Hawkins, and John Kelmer, who left me some very nice comments on YouTube for episode 24. Thanks, guys. It's very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. A quick few words about what I'm working on. I optioned the limited location horror thriller script I've been talking about over the last few podcasts. It's not a great option. It's basically a free option for six months, and then the producer has to pay a decent amount of money to re-option it. I say basically free because he has to pay me $10, so I guess technically it's not free, but it might as well be. In any event, the producer is actually the same producer who optioned my sci-fi thriller screenplay earlier in the year. He seemed like a good fit for this project as he seems to like the script and he's done some of these types of films before. He has a couple of good leads for finding financing, so we'll see. It's a long way for production, but it is good to at least have a solid producer out there trying to raise money for it. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing the founder of No Bull Script Consulting, Danny Manis. Here is the interview. Welcome, Danny, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So to start out, I wonder if you can give us a quick overview of your career, how you got into the entertainment industry, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very common kind of story. It's nothing crazy. I interned. Uh, I spent a semester out here interning uh, while I was in college. I went back. I was in college in New York and uh, did a semester in L.A., interning at uh, Columbia TriStar in their TV development department and uh, at Fox Feature Casting because I liked casting and I had a cousin who worked in it so I figured I should have some background in case I really, really need a job one day. Um, and, uh, and I loved it. I loved being out here. So after graduation, I came back out. I interviewed at a few places. I came out to do TV writing um, and that didn't happen because I came out at a time when they weren't crewing up for anything. Um, and uh, so I took the first job I got, which was off the UTA job list, uh, as an assistant at a feature film production company. Uh, and I was their assistant for about a year or so. Uh, and then they promoted me to creative executive and, and then director of development and um, and was doing production coordinating uh, for all of their films at the same time as running their development. Uh, and that was at Sandstorm Films, and uh, which was run by a, a writer-director, J.S. Cardone, who's done a bunch of stuff. Um, and, uh, and then I, they closed. Uh, we had a deal with Screen Gems. We had a deal with Top Cow Comics, um, which was great for a little while. And then they just decided to part ways. So um, closed. I went over to Clifford Werber Productions um, as their creative executive and then director of development. Uh, and uh, and then what, I was at Eclectic Pictures after that, after the writer strike. I lost, uh, they, you know, we kind of had to cut down during the writer strike. 
Um, and so after that, I, I worked another company for a little while as a development consultant, and uh, and then started uh, my script consulting company. Um, but and, and teaching and doing all that kind of stuff. But yeah, over the years, I think I've done everything from from casting and production to development, obviously, mm -hmm. consulting, teaching, producing, writing. I came out to okay. write, but uh -huh. l like everybody else. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But development found me first, and development uh -huh. was pretty fun. Okay, great. So um, before um, the interview, we were discussing some of the films um, that you specifically worked on. Let's start out with um, Sidney White, a film that you um, helped to develop. Um, can you kind of give us sort of some insight into how that project was found, how it was developed, um, just so, you know, aspiring writers kind of wondering, gee, how does a film like that get made? Where does the script come from? Where's the production company? How do they find the writers for something like that? Yeah, um, Sydney White, which we did at, uh, at my company Clifford Werber Productions. Um, it was Amanda Bynes' last movie before she went you know, a little cuckoo. <laughs> um, and uh, it was an idea. Uh, my boss, Clifford Werber, had done Cinderella Story, and it did $100 million. So obviously he went, okay, this works. What other film can I update and do? Um, he was a little before his time, since fairy tales are hot right now and getting, you know, remade all over the place. Um, but he was like, okay, how about uh, Snow White? What can we do with that? So he he had an idea for it. He found the writers. Um, he knew one of the writers. There were two writers who are now married at the time. They were boyfriend-girlfriend, uh, who were in the Peter Stark program. Um, they were also... Uh, assistance to John August at the time. Clifford found them, uh, Dara, uh, Resnick, Creasy, and Chad, uh, and Chad Creasy, who are now uh, producers on Castle, actually. Um, but uh, they had written, just coincidentally, they had written a short for their thesis, a thesis uh, script. I'm not sure, if, actually, if it was a short or a feature, but thesis for their Peter Stark program. They found Clifford. He went, this is exactly what I want to do. He optioned, uh, you know, their their script and started developing it. Um, they were not paid for the option, um, and um, and that started, I think, a, a six or seven year process before it actually got made. Uh, but they developed the script, went through a number of uh, iterations um, before my time, before I even came on, and then once I came on, we redeveloped the script. Um, we, uh, I'm going to try and, oh, there we go, uh, sorry, we, um, we did a lot of notes, we finally got it going, uh, we brought it to Morgan Creek, who was, uh, financier and still active at the time, um, they really liked the idea, it was a low budget, pretty low budget project, and teen movies were still selling decently at the time, um, and, uh, and we brought on uh, a director that we really liked, Joe Nussbaum, who had done uh, one of the American Pie movies. He did um, George Lucas in Love, the short, the infamous short. Um, and, um, and he really had a knack for the younger teen kind of world and, and that kind of voice. Um, and then, you know, we, had to, we went through drafts and drafts and drafts. Morgan Creek had a number of notes. We brought on rewriters uh, to, once we were at Morgan Creek, we brought on, after searching, uh, scouring uh, the earth for rewriters, we brought on uh, two great rewriters, um, Rarden and O'Toole, as they are known, and uh, they did a great job. Uh, we brought in, we had a comedy round table, which is where you pick five or six or seven people and you pay them a couple thousand dollars for the day and they sit around the table just to make things funnier um, and that was a day or two of that uh, and then and Joe came in and, and did his notes and we had our notes and it was a, a lot of drafts and we read a lot of samples by the way before we chose rewriters a lot of samples um, and that's what a development exec does mm -hmm. all day every day <laughs> um, but uh, yeah uh, it, and then it, it got going but as 
as it got going, uh, the title changed. It was originally Sidney White and the Seven Dorks, which we thought was really cute. Uh, Morgan Creek, I don't think any of this is a total secret, but, you know, Morgan Creek thought that aimed too young. Um, and Clifford always thought it should be a, a slightly younger movie. Morgan Creek wanted to go a little bit older. Joe wanted to go a little bit older. Um, and uh, and so we changed it just to Sidney White, and it kind of lost a little bit of that cachet, we think, a little mm-hmm. bit. But um, I, I didn't, when I read the title, it didn't immediately occur to me that it was a modern day um, yeah. retelling. So Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we lost something with the loss of the dorks. Um, especially since they are such a big part of the actual movie and, and actually where all the comedy comes from is, is the dorks. Uh, so by not listing them in a title, um, I think it was probably a mistake. Probably cost us a few million dollars in, in grosses. Uh, it, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the biggest issue we ever came up, came across during the whole development process is what the demographic was that we were going for. And we had an obstacle in that Amanda Bynes, you know, this was a college set movie, um, but it was also a fairy tale. We had a star in Amanda whose core demographic was, you know, 8 to 13 and not 15 to 18. Um, And how do you tell a college set movie without mentioning drinking, partying, you know, any kind of sex, bad words? You know, it doesn't totally feel genuine. And and Joe wanted to age it up and make it really m- much more of a, a PG-13, you know, teen movie. But um, Clifford didn't think that the audience of that, uh, you know, that age of an audience would go see a fairy tale remake of, of Snow White, you know, uh, with Amanda Bynes. And so um, we got caught in the middle. You know, we had a, a PG concept with a couple of PG-13 characters and jokes. Um, with a PG star in a PG-13 setting and a PG title, and it, it just kind of, you know, uh, mm-hmm. just a little bit. And, and that's yeah, why it's yeah. so important for writers to know who they're writing for um, and know the tone that they want to set with their whatever genre it might be. Um, mm-hmm. but that's, in this that's, case, it sounds like, it sounds like though, it was... Um, it almost sounds like it's a, it's not a script thing as much as it's a casting choice. As you just said with Amanda Bynes, her demographic is that younger set. So if you had just cast somebody else, you could have gone more after the American Pie type of a, a group. We could have. Uh, Clifford is is very big on family films. You know, he had a young daughter, and um, and he wanted to replicate the success, obviously, of Cinderella Story, which did very well with the kind of 8 to 14 and strangely like 40 year old women um and so he really wanted to replicate that kind of tone and that kind of comedy and i think we did it was just maybe it was a little bit of casting and a little bit of just the indecision between all the producers involved um as well as the writers and directors everybody in the room amanda wanted to do something a little bit older and a little bit more risque but um, it just didn't quite connect. I, I will say that in our focus groups and test screenings, the they were, I mean, through the roof. We had a, I mean, it was like 94% in the good columns. It was crazy. Hmm. Um, so we were, what really, the other thing is, it was marketed really, really badly. Um, and not much marketing and to the wrong venues and at that time myspace was still you know facebook wasn't really around it was still myspace and and so yeah they took over myspace for a day and they took over mtv for a day and abc family and stuff but it just it wasn't enough um so i think it was a combination of factors but actually if you do see it it's a very cute movie um i have a couple lines in there that i that i think stuck um but (laughs) Uh, which is always nice when a development mm-hmm. exec gets a couple lines in a movie. It's like, ah, we earned our money. Uh, uh-huh. But, uh, you know, um, the writers did a great job. All our writers did a great job. Um, and it turned out to be really cute. Uh, mm-hmm. It just didn't connect at the box office. But it more than made its money back between DVD and, and box office and everything. So Okay. Let's take a step back and, and let me just dissect some of the things that you said. You said um, that your boss, he came up with this idea for a Snow White 
sort of retelling of a Snow White, but then they optioned a script from these guys. So how developed was that idea? And it just coincidentally, it sort of was the same idea that these writers had already written. And they had written, uh, I, I'm not sure if I heard this correctly, they had written a short or they had written a feature that was basically the same idea. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't remember if they had written a short or a feature. I want to say it was a feature um, spec uh, for as their thesis film. And it was coincidental that he was already developing a Sydney White, a, a Snow White project, um, and knew uh, knew these writers. Um, he knew uh, he knew Dara, and you know, uh, actually, now that I remember, Dara was either his assistant or his friend's assistant, um, and Chad was John August's assistant, and he knew, and Chad had written it kind of with Dara uh, as their thesis project. And so he went through Dara, got to Chad. They, I, I don't know exactly how far along, knowing what we've done with other projects, Clifford probably had a two or three or four page treatment because um, most of our ideas were homegrown. We would sit in a room, uh, you know, every week and spitball ideas and come up with ideas and flesh out ideas and then try to find writers who would be great um, at developing them and, and writing them with us. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was back in the day when you could sell original material. Um, you know, that's that's what we did. I would probably say half of our development slate were ideas that either Clifford or I came up with and then tried to develop. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was a coincidence that he was already developing idea he mentioned it to Dara, and Dara goes, oh, my boyfriend and I were writing that script. Uh, we wrote that script for Peter Stark, and literally it was a coincidence, and, and mm -hmm. he optioned it from there. Um, okay. And now, the, the, you mentioned that it was a free option, and obviously these writers are, are new writers, so I'm curious, as you start, okay, so he reads the script, he likes it enough, it's close enough to his idea, I'm sure there was quite a bit of development right off the bat to get it into the thing. Did you, did you hire the writers? Was there pay for those writers at that point? Nope. So, and was that common? Like you just mentioned, you had this development slate and you, four page treatments. You'd go out and try and find writers. You would go try and find writers and basically write on spec? Yep, completely. Okay. Uh, then yeah. what I, I've, I get some of these offers and I'm always curious what, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of always curious. Number one, it doesn't seem like any of them ever take off. So I'm always, as a writer, I'm always very leery to get involved with them. Did one of the things that I've suggested and I've gotten some pushback from, from, producers and development executives is I always say okay fine but I want a clear contract that if you know you get like some sort of an option on the script once it's finished development for a year but then I get the script back unencumbered by you and basically you would lose any you know attachment to that what was sort of the arrangement that you would set up with these writers yeah uh, we always had a contract um, uh, it was always if um, if it was a project that was already written that was not our idea um, then we would usually do an exclusive attachment agreement, which is, you know, kind of like a option, um, except you still own, the writer still owns all the rights to their story. We're just basically, we have the exclusive right to shop it for X amount of time, you know, whether it's a year, 18 months, whatever it might be. Um, and, and of course we have a contract in place, so if we were to sell it, you know, the writer would get a, B, and C, and uh, uh, and there's usually a floor and a ceiling that we put into the contracts, only because we obviously want a floor so that the writer doesn't get screwed and they actually make some money. We put a ceiling so that we don't get screwed, so that when the studio comes back and says, we love it, how much do you want for it? The writer doesn't go, a million dollars, mm -hmm. and screws up the deal completely, and we get effed. Can I curse on this podcast? Um, I'd prefer if you didn't. Okay. I try and keep okay, it sorry. clean. <laughs> okay. Um, then we get screwed. Um, and uh, and so, uh, but it, but yeah, all um, if our options lapse, all the notes, all the work that we've done or changes revert back to the writer. They they get it free and clear. That's the way we structured our deals. There's plenty of producers who don't. Even when you, that? even though when, even when the idea, the seed of the idea came from you guys, even with a four-page treatment, you would still give all that to the writer. No, if it was our idea that we came up with and we hired a writer on spec uh, to write it, 
uh, we would still uh, obviously have a contract um, with all the same things, uh, you know, floor and ceiling and, and what we would sell it for and make best efforts to get them into WGA and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, but no, if it didn't sell, the rights still lie with Clifford, uh, with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't, I mean, I will say of the projects that we've developed that we have at the time, um, that we got writers on, the first was Cinderella Story, Lee Dunlap made a couple million dollars from that movie and went on to have a screenwriting career for quite a while. Um, Chad and Dara made a good amount of money, um, I won't say how much, or I don't know how much, but, um, you know, from Sidney White, and, uh, and it landed them a lot of writing assignments, and they've now been on four, three or four different TV series, and they're producers, you know, mm-hmm. and top writers in town. Um, we've had a couple others uh, that have gone on to really nice screenwriting careers, and we've had a few that haven't, that were mm-hmm. newer writers that we took a chance on because either I knew them or it worked with them or Clifford worked with them um, and we couldn't sell the project and you know yeah it sucks when a project doesn't sell what writers I'm a big proponent of the dollar option or the free option and I'll tell you why Um, it's because a lot of people say oh don't trust a producer who doesn't have skin in the game like I get that but our skin is our you know, our time and our sweat equity that we're putting in, and unlike a writer who gets paid the second we set it up, we don't get paid at all unless it gets made. So Mm -hmm. we're working for free for three or four years. Um, We have every intention and every motivation to get something made because we'd like to get paid. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I I think any producer... Now, that's saying, as long as you do your due diligence and they are real producers with credits and contacts and they have a plan for your project and they have real notes that will help your project and you have a good working relationship with them, then I don't see the problem with the dollar option. You're finding a legit producer who is now a cheerleader for you, your career, your project, can help you get other work, and you can say, I'm an option screenwriter working with this legitimate producer. I think mm-hmm. that's huge for a first-time writer um, or a new writer or what a, you know, an unproduced writer um, to, to be able to say and to do and to be in development on something that's real. Yeah, there's... The, the, one, the one thing to, and um, the one question that I always give producers and they usually seem overly honest. I don't think they quite understand why I'm asking this question, but I always ask them, how many other projects like this are you developing? And as I said, this was maybe six months ago, but I had a, I had a very similar to what you're talking about. I was meeting the development executive and I asked him that and he, said, and he was very proud of the fact he had like 25 projects and his boss had another 25 projects. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so I'm basically one of 50. What are the chances? And, and it was his idea. So it was the same thing. It wasn't like I was ever going to get that, that get that project back. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm basically, you you got 50 projects you're developing. What are the odds that mine is going to be the one that goes? And um, and I don't get the script back because it was an idea that they, they cooked up with right. internally. Um, so it just seems like eh, I don't have a problem with the free option as a writer because precisely what you're saying. But the great thing about the free option is after six months or a year, I get the script back and I can take it somewhere else unencumbered by these these other people. Um, but the other the other, you know, when it's your idea, it's like you're basically stuck stuck with them forever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if it's your idea, you get it back unencumbered and, and, you know, after the time is up, absolutely. Yeah, when it's not your idea, you know, sometimes you're taking a chance. Um, You know, we're, I see both sides of it. I think the producer is taking a chance on a writer that they can't automatically sell in a room, you know, and the writer's taking a chance on an idea that may never get sold um, but part of their and correct me if I'm wrong and you can tell me your your experience but part of their strategy is precisely what I just said let's develop 50 projects and hope that one of them goes and that's oh, that's okay for the producer but that's not so good for the 49 writers yeah well not if it's the 50 of the same idea if they're trying to develop you know the same no idea. no these were different ideas okay. yeah no these were different okay. ideas because they're yeah they're developing the same idea with 10 different writers that's just a shitty Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 these were different working. ideas. Um, yeah. You want to stay away from that producer. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think certainly at the studios, they probably have, 
you know, 50 to 75 projects in development at any time. And, uh, I mean, we were, you know, in, in a, a smaller indie uh, production company. We probably had anywhere between a dozen to, to, to two dozen projects in different stages of development. Some were just conceptual and some were, you know, we were working on the 10th draft of a script or we had sold it and, you know, and we're trying to uh, get the rewrites done and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is a numbers game, but it's a numbers game for a writer, too. That's why I tell writers, you know, never just have one script. You know, you have one idea, one script, you're kind of useless. Um, you know, you have to keep many logs in the fire, whether you're a producer, an actor, a writer, a director. You know, keep different logs in the fire, keep developing and coming up with new ideas, because you never know when you're going to need that next idea. And so, yeah, I kind of, I, I, I get the point, you don't want to be one of 75, but I will say that if it's their idea, and they own it, and the development exec stands to get some credit and money for it, they're going to push that much harder for that project to go than some random project that came to the, to them through some random place that they don't really have a personal connection to, um, but that their boss kind of liked the idea of, you know, and so sometimes doing those projects will get a little bit more extra attention uh, mm -hmm. when it's their own homegrown ideas. Mm -hmm. But, you know... One, one thing you mentioned, um, just, and it wasn't even really in reference to this, you mentioned the strike, the writer's strike, and I, was that 2009 that the writer's strike was? Two, 2008. Okay. 2008. One of the one of the things that I hear quite commonly is that everything sort of changed after that, and there was a lot more of this. What you're describing, where producers are getting writers basically to to write these ideas on spec, but it sounds like you guys were doing that before the writers strike. So, um, did you see any change in in that in sort of the approach that your company took before and after the strike? Uh, well, after the <laughs> shortly after the strike, I didn't have a job no more. Uh, okay, so that, <laughs> that is a slightly different <laughs> approach. But, um, uh, you know, we were, it was strange during the strike. We actually sold something during the strike and we got one of the waivers and stuff. Uh, I actually sold something during the strike, which was supposed to be a very big project. It was at, uh, United Artists, um, and, uh, Tom Cruise's, uh, company. And, um, it was a really big deal for me. And then, uh, then it died anyway and got put into turnaround. It was an Oz movie. Uh, and, of course, we know there was an Oz movie made, but we were actually the first one. There were four Oz movies in contention around town. We were the first one that sold, um, but unfortunately it just didn't happen. Um, but uh, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think there was a huge difference after the writer strike in the way people operated in terms of writers and options, I think. Independent producers were still were doing that before the writer strike and continue to do that after the writer strike. I think uh, maybe some of the larger companies that were doing that maybe stopped doing that. And, and the reason for that isn't really the writers. It was that during the writer strike and shortly and for the months following, so little was actually getting made that people could not uh, afford to keep their development staffs. There were, it was like a diaspora of development execs that were just released onto Hollywood uh, to find new jobs, and there were very, very, very few jobs um, for a while. And I mean, there were probably like a hundred of us who were looking for the same six jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the reason that development got cut down and people weren't doing as much development is very simply they didn't want to spend the time and they didn't have the staffs anymore to actually develop. And so they changed their MOs to uh, what I used to call the 50% rule. Like, if the script is 50% there, we'll get it the other 50%. It just has to be a really good idea and kind of good enough for us to work with. And it quickly became like the 85% rule. Like, if it's not 85% there, we're not going to get involved because we don't want to take a year to develop this project. It's not worth our time anymore. If we can't do one, you know, one or two quick sets of notes, be done, go package it, and, and go pitch it, you know, three days from now, then we're not going to work on it anymore. And I think that was the shift. It wasn't so much, it was indirectly because of the strike, but I think it was actually because so many companies lost their overhead deals. 
um, or their pod deals or whatever you want to call them, and and they lost their development staffs. And because of that, they had to change the way that they were uh, putting projects together. Mm-hmm. Did they? Do you think these companies just found that that was a better way to do business? And they, because now it's been many years, they haven't rehired a lot of these development executives and sort of staff back up. Um, a lot have. I think you know. I think they probably realized, oh, we can, you know, we can find projects that are closer. We don't have to work this hard in development for three years on a project. Um, yeah, certainly some places have crewed up. Some people have, cl- you know, some places have closed down. New places have come up instead. Um, and and what happened was about six months after um, after the strike and after the big uh, agency merge is that a lot of those agents then became managers and they needed to crew up and, and staff up. And so a lot of the execs eventually or assistants, you know, went to work for them. And um, But, yeah, I mean, what the what the writer strike did was kind of put a just a cog in the middle of the system. And so people were either losing their jobs and couldn't find new ones or they were now stuck in their jobs, which means nobody was getting promoted, nobody was moving up, nobody knew could find new jobs you know, uh, as everybody kind of moves up the ladder. Um, and it made everybody kind of stuck for a year in whatever, in wherever they were. Uh, for me, that was, uh, (laughs) unemployment, um, for, for a little while. And I I did start with a new company, um, about six months later, but for, for a short time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it was a weird time. I think it, it's gotten back a little bit. But, yeah, people, I think producers are still like, it's not worth our time anymore to develop something from the ground up that's going to take two years with a new writer to develop. You you know, we want something that either comes with a package or that we could package immediately. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that's changed completely. Okay, so let's move on to another movie that you worked on called The Covenant. Yeah. Um, can you kind of do the same thing? Give us kind of um, how your company found that and how that script got developed. Um, Covenant uh, was when I was at Sandstorm Films. We had a first look deal with uh, Sony Screen Gems. We had done a number of movies for them over the three years that I was there. I think we did six movies, six or seven movies, which is a lot uh, in in three years. Um, Most of them with Screen Gems. Some of them were programmers, uh, meaning they went straight to DVD. um, Because back then, DVD was was still a huge business. Mm And those movies made a ton of money on DVD, let me tell you. Uh, The Sniper movies made a ton of movies on DVD. Um, But uh, this was right after Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter, came out. uh, And Joe Cardone, my boss, uh, the writer-director, who has always done kind of horror thriller, he has a very kind of dark sensibility, went to... um, uh, Clint Culpepper, who was the president of the Screen Gems, or Clint may have come to him. I'm not. I don't remember exactly which happened first. And uh, Clint came to him actually and said, "Harry Potter's doing crazy business. Uh, you know, Screen Gems at the time was still doing a lot of hor- you know, mostly horror movies and genre movies. Um, and they said we want to do Harry Potter on crack. We want to do the dark, twisted, R-rated, sexy version of Harry Potter." And Joe said, great, let's do it. He came up with a treatment. They loved the treatment. And Joe's treatments were always like scriptments, kind of what's called scriptments now, where they're very long and they include some dialogue and specific scenes. And, you know, they're like 50 pages long. Hmm. Um, And so, you know, he turned that in. Clint loved it, said, great, let's do it. So uh, Joe went, wrote the script. Um, You know, he he had a couple of us in the office and a couple writers that we worked with who gave notes, um, you know, did a couple of drafts, turned it into Screen Gems. Uh, they literally went, we love it, it's fantastic, um, but could we take out the sexiness and the darkness and the, there was a rape scene in there, Can you got to take that out, and can you take out some of the scares and some of the drugs, and um, basically we'd like to now make this a PG-13 Harry Potter, but just slightly, a little bit darker, you know, and mm-hmm. so it, you know, it kind of took the wind out of it. It took the, the wind out of Joe because he was so invested in this very creepy prep school, you know, 
dark northeastern kind of feel and um and the the sexiness of it was really what Joe always responds to as a dark sexy quality in a script um and so once he was kind of told we have to lighten it up and take out all the sex he you know then it kind of became just a a writing exercise until the studio was happy um and i would probably say there were 8 or 9 drafts probably done eight, eight to ten drafts maybe not all of those turned into the studio but most um and we got notes back and the marketing department had their notes i mean everybody had their notes mm -hmm. and then um they brought on a director um who uh rennie harlan who of course did cliffhanger like one of my favorite cliffhanger and long um uh, and uh, what Long Kiss Goodnight? I mean, he's had some great movies, and then he's had some not so good movies. And um, you know, and so he came on, which is a, a, was a big coup for the studio, but he didn't kind of share in the same vision. And we were very detached. Once Rennie came on, we became much more detached um, uh, in terms of our development, you know, staff from from the process. But um, you know, the movie got made. It was number one at the box office. It more than made its money back. Uh, Joe made a lot of money. It's sold on cable, and he gets a ton of residuals. Mm -hmm. And um, and it did very well. And it was it was big for Clint. It was big for Joe. It was both of their uh, second number one movies at the box office. Um, and it did well. But it it went from this very dark, twisted, sexual story of you know Harry Potter on crack to basically like warlock boys blowing bubbles shirtless in a shower and you know <laughs> yeah. it, um it changed i will say mm -hmm. that like three of the stars that was like their first or second movie and now they're they're big stars um but yeah um it was an interesting process just to see how much it changed from concept to the screen and mm -hmm. we were all sitting there at the premiere you know watching the movie and we went yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, let's hope it does well, you know. Mm -hmm. And it did. Um, but yeah, it wasn't the movie we, uh, anybody at Sandstrom set out to make. But it was the movie that got made. It was the movie that made a lot of money, mm -hmm. and uh, and everybody got paid. So yeah, yeah. So now, when when they came to Joe with with this sort of idea of of Harry Potter on crack, and he wrote up this treatment, certainly a writer that has a track record like that, they paid for that yeah. treatment. Yeah. So then they get some sort of a deal, two step, three step deal, yeah. and and gets to paid for all these right rewrites. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, he went through the. I mean, yeah, normal. He's WGA and everything. He's yeah. He went through normal channels. I will say that, you know, whatever the steps are, I don't know too many writers who don't do more steps than are actually asked i mean joe's one of those writers who will just do it until it's done right until he's happy with it and he doesn't really care you know that mm. he's only supposed to do two drafts like he's going to do it until he does it right and him and clint have a very long-standing friendly relationship they work together on a lot of stuff uh even to this day and so it, it's a little bit different of a relationship but yes he got paid for all the all the steps <laughs> perfect perfect so um so now let's kind of take a step um forward in your career to um your your consulting work um how just ballpark over the years as a consultant as a development executive how many scripts would you say you have read Ooh, um i mean over the last uh what 11 years um i mean it's thousands um I I've probably had I've probably had about a thousand clients or so, give or take, since I started the company about five years ago. Um, not all of those are scripts, you know, but uh, but a large portion, most of them. Um, but I, I I'm still reading. I still try to keep up a little bit uh, when mm -hmm. I can of what's out there. Or read the blacklist scripts or or you know some of the list, the blood list and stuff that comes out, but. Um, or if there's a really good script that I hear going around town that I think I should read. Um, but yeah, I don't know the number. I used to keep track. I kept track for the first like five or six years and then I stopped keeping track. I still have okay. a log, so I'm sure I could. I'm but sure the bottom could... line is we're talking about, about many thousands of scripts yeah, at this it's, point. It's, so it's, yeah, it's many thousands of scripts. I'd probably say, I don't know, you figure 500 scripts a year, um, 
for a number of scripts. Yeah, it's yeah. somewhere in there. For okay, so maybe you, um, as someone who's read thousands of scripts, maybe you can just give us a few tips for writers. You know, um, you must have a few tips that you think every writer could benefit from. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely uh, certain things that you see in a script constantly. It's a lot of it, for me, some writers don't like to outline. Um, when I do a project, uh, I'm an anal outliner. I need an outline. I need something. Um, but I think uh, for new writers, it's, it's important to outline, uh, or newer writers. You know, maybe you've written a couple scripts, you haven't sold anything yet. Maybe you're not repped, but you're trying to get repped. Um, and you're still working on projects. I think outlining is really key um, because it gives you something to go back to. It gives you something to kind of develop and brainstorm the idea. And I find that most writers get very dead set. They come up with a concept and they're just like a little bit of tunnel vision on how they think that concept could go without brainstorming the idea much and seeing how else it could go that maybe that's the more commercial way or maybe that's the more interesting way for a character to go and that usually comes out when you're plotting and outlining and if you're not outlining and you go just concept to page you usually lose some of that process and some of that um, vision for the project that you might be able to, to get and so uh, yeah I always uh, I mean one of my tips is always try to outline write a short treatment something uh, to help flesh out the story and the characters um, I have some great character exercises I always kind of recommend to my students and clients uh, to do to kind of make sure that they are developing three-dimensional, original, interesting characters. Um, because, I don't know, some people say it's all concept, some people say it's all character. I think you can't have one without the other, really. Um, you know, I think, uh, like I said, knowing the audience you're writing for, knowing what kind of tone um, or mix of tone, genre or mix of genre you're going for, and really having a strong setup of those things, um, you know, in the first ten pages and, and in your first act is only going to help you later down the pike. Um, do you have some tips for, for, for writers on, on how they can determine sort of what tone they're going for and what sort of audience they're going for? Well, I mean, I think every concept, some concepts can go different ways, um, but I think you find kind of the natural, what I like to call kind of the natural story, the natural blueprint for your concept. It should kind of scream a certain genre. Um, yeah, there's some that could be funny or could be dramatic or could be a mixture of both. Um, but I think if you find what your hook is and you know what your hook is to your concept of what makes it new and what makes it different and stand out, you know, what genre does that hook speak most closely to? You know, how, in what genre will you be able to exploit that hook in the most original, interesting, visual ways? Um, and if you can figure that out, you'll kind of know what genre you should probably be writing. But it's also a personal choice of what genre do you like writing? You know, mm -hmm. if uh, I would say if you, you know, go to five people that know you and ask them to describe you in three words, if none of them use the word funny, you probably shouldn't be writing a comedy. <laughs> um, that's probably yeah. not your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to do what's kind of natural to you. And sometimes you have this idea for a comedy, but you know you're not funny, you know you're not a comedy writer, and that's when you have to maybe find someone else to write it with you or write it for you or, or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you develop it and then kind of hand it off to somebody. But, um, yeah, I think it's just about finding what feels the most natural um, to your concept and in which genre you could explore and have the most fun with your concept. And then it's deciding, once you have that genre, you know, if it's comedy, what kind of tone of comedy? If it's horror, what kind of tone of horror? Um, you know, how light, how dark, how uh, broad, you know, you want to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's it's what works best for your story, and that's where the brainstorming and kind of outlining comes comes in handy. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have a couple of, of screenplays that you just recommend everybody reads, um, even some offbeat recommendations? It's a great... 
God, we were just, I think we were just talking about this maybe a couple months ago on Stage 32. There was this great thread of, um, uh, of scripts you recommend. There was. There are a bunch of scripts that I always like, and now I have to think of them. Um, I, I loved, um, I mean, I recommend everybody read the Blacklist scripts, the real Blacklist scripts. Uh, when they, you know, when they come out in uh, at the end of December, early January, um, they're great for voice and, you know, to see what executives are reading out there. Um, uh, Prisoners w- was a really good one. I liked the movie, but I thought the script was was really excellent in terms of, you know, elevating a genre that's been done many, many times before, uh, and setting a tone and, and different uh, had a create reveals uh, in a script that are really interesting and, and, and compelling. Um, uh, what are some great ones? I mean, it's always great to read Tarantino and Sorkin with the caveat that, which is what I tell everyone, you're not Tarantino and Sorkin. You know, and everybody reads Tarantino and goes, oh, I can write 40 pages of prose and nobody will stop me. No, he can write 40 pages of prose and nobody mm-hmm. will stop him. You can't. And so I worry a little bit that people read, you know, the greats of the greats and then, you know, imitate rules and thing and do things that you can't get away with unless you're the greatest of the great. But mm-hmm. they're, they're still great to read. Um, I love this. I like the script from her last year was one of was okay. you know, won the Oscar, but it was one of my favorite scripts. I taught a web mm-hmm. about it. Um, so I was a big fan of that. Um, I mean, everything, I'm trying to think of other ones that I really, really love. I mean, American Beauty back in the day was one of my favorites. I mean, I remember, you know, you got to read Chinatown, and you got to read The Player, and you got to read, um, you know, uh, some of those Shawshank Redemption and some of those classics. Um, I just read um, Source Code. Um, I thought oh, that yeah. was, was, was an excellent script. Um, highly recommend that to everyone. Yeah, if you're writing so. sci-fi, you know, Looper or something is a really great script. There are some scripts people love that I personally couldn't get through, like Brick. Like, it's just a really hard script. Like, I, I just couldn't get through it. I, it's mm-hmm. But um, it's one of those scripts you either love or you hate. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think you want to read something in every genre. You know, read... Um, you know, read The Conjuring and read, uh, you know, some classic horror. Um, yeah, if you can find find a uh, cabin in the woods, you know, or uh, I I actually never read the script, but I love the movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's so much good stuff out there. Philomena um, from last year was was great. Uh, yeah, read stuff with voice, you know. You can find them on the blacklist. You can find them on the blood list or the Brit list or the young and hungry list or whatever. But, I mean, you want to read stuff that is getting out there, that is getting people work, that, you know, may be written by people slightly at a different um, career point than you are, but not all the way up here top of the A-list. Because I tend Mm -hmm. to think top of the A-list, you know, all those writers will say, oh, there are no rules. Do whatever you want. And they're right for them. You know, mm-hmm. for everybody else, there's still some stuff you kind of have to do and or not do, and so if you read stuff just slightly below that level, uh, mm-hmm. and at all levels, um, it can only help. Um, read really crappy scripts, really bad scripts, and and do your own set of notes on them. Um, that's what I tell all my writers to do: is you, sh- if you're serious about this, you should be reading two scripts a week. Um, from wherever there's enough peer sites or free script sites out there with pros and non-pros amateurs uh, you know that run the gamut you should be reading two scripts a week it should take you about three hours give or take three to four hours out of your week and Mm -hmm. do a half a page of notes write up what you would have changed write up what you would have done with that concept or what you think the problems with the script are and if I mean that's what development execs do every day and that's how interns learn is from doing their own coverage. I didn't know what coverage was. I never heard the term before I was an intern. And Mm -hmm. they were like, here, do coverage. Here's how we do it. Um, And then make it your own. And that's what they said. And uh, and then you you learn by fire, which is kind of what Hollywood is. It's just learning Mm -hmm. by fire. And and that's, I mean, that's what I would suggest is just 
be to everything. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's um let's talk a minute about your um consulting um company, No Bull Script Consulting. Can you kind of tell us, give us a two minute elevator speech about that? And um, yeah, sure. Um, oh, before I do, the other thing I did want to say about writers and and the mistakes they make is the number one mistake, hands down. Okay. Is that they um, a they don't do their research, and b they start sending out scripts, submitting, querying, you know, pitching things that are nowhere near ready or they the writers are nowhere near ready and they you know they just want to do it because look I've I've written the first draft and so where's my agent and my million dollars like how do I get this into Hollywood's hands it's gold I written I did it I finished 100 pages and you know and newer writers especially don't know the just the process that it takes the rewriting process and the polishing and the fixing and and how much of a time restraint, just how long it actually takes until mm-hmm. you get good. And every pro I've ever talked to said, yeah, I didn't start sending something out until my 5th, 8th, 10th, 15th script. I didn't think I was good enough. Uh, and that's why everyone's like, well, why am I not breaking in? And the reason's usually because you're not ready yet and you should just keep writing. Uh, you know, you don't need an agent when you already ha- when you only have one script. They don't care about you yet. Write two more and then start mm-hmm. learning about it. But I think that's the number one thing people do that's wrong is they just submit before they're ready. Same even to contests. You know, if you're sending a first draft to a contest, you're not gonna win. You're not gonna win. You're mm-hmm. throwing fifty dollars out the window. Um, and so that's that's the number one. It's not a craft question. It's not a craft issue uh, completely, except that they don't know the craft enough, um, which I know we talked about on on stage thirty two, and it's just you know. No, you're I have not. mixed I have mixed emotions on that. Um, you know, in the entrepreneurial world, there's this thing called um, customer development, and and as screenwriters, our customers are producers. I actually, when I started out, I literally sent a query letter to. <laughs> Say hello um, to my cat. <laughs> hey, cat. Um, I literally sent a query letter to. I had never written a screenplay. I wrote up ten pages of script that I thought was hilarious. I had no. This was back way before the internet, so I had no way of formatting it properly. I just looked at a play in the library and formatted it roughly the same, and I sent these ten pages of script to two to two production companies and um one of the guys responded this is the day of, of self-addressed stamped um postcards he sent back the postcard hey thank you for your undated untitled manuscript no thanks and the other guy though he actually called me and he gave me some great advice he said listen stop sending this nonsense out go read sidfield's screenplay but the, my point is is that i do feel like Part of my learning process is actually getting out there and marketing and talking to producers. And, I mean, there is something to what you're saying, so I'm not just disagreeing with you. You do have to have something that is um, at least halfway decent. You should be reading enough scripts. You know, if you're reading two scripts a week after you know six months, you should have some idea. You should be able to read your own script and realistically know that it's complete garbage and it's not ready. But once you get to that certain point, I feel like – you you need to get out there and maybe it's not maybe you're not up to professional standards but it's pretty close and you're getting to the point where you know a few agents might call you some low budget desperate producers might call you and that interaction and even just the rejection sending out 100 query letters and getting nothing but no's is part of your process you know what maybe my log line isn't good maybe my my concepts are not good enough and so i know from the development executive they hate this getting you know scripts and letters from writers that aren't ready but from from the writer's perspective, I think there is some benefit from getting rejected and oh, getting, yeah. um, yeah, no, I just t- interfacing t- with producers. Yeah, no, I totally. I mean, look, rejection is going to be part of the process, you know, for the rest of your career, no matter you know what point you're at. It's absolutely a valuable part of the process. I and I'm all for writers getting out there once they get to that level. I think there is there is that thing of if you just read enough scripts or watch enough movies you'll get good enough. And I don't find any credence in that. I think you have to have some sort of background, education. I mean, some sort of background. Like, if I... I mean, I don't know. I've, like I said, I've read thousands of scripts. I don't think I was any good at really dissecting them and knowing how to get to the heart of them and how to fix them for 
you know, at the time I did, but now looking back, I don't think I was very good for the first four years. I don't think I knew what the hell I was doing at all. I Like, I knew what I liked, I knew what I didn't like. I could, you know, find the big obvious things that everybody could find, you know, in a bad script. But in terms of, like, the learning curve of how I look at a script so in-depth now and the different elements as opposed to then... It's, I mean, it's an insane difference. And so I think you have to have that instinct. You have to have something internal that, that you have, a storytelling skill that is somewhat innate or developed over your whole entire life. Uh, it's not something you're just going to learn from reading 100 scripts or mm-hmm. watching 100 movies. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's the doctor or, the, you know, the, the pre-med student who just took his first anatomy class. And he goes, all right, I'm ready for heart surgery. He's like, no, you're at day one, and it's great that you're here, and that's your first step and keep going. But that's your first step. And so, you know, if you jump from step A to step Z, you know, and then try to send something out that is totally not ready, rejection's great, but you're also kind of screwing yourself a little bit, you know, at at some point, depending on who you send it to or how you send it. Um, I just think a a little bit of education and a little bit of, a little bit of time sometimes goes a long way. Um, But I mean, I'm all for people getting out there. Uh, That's what I try to help my clients do. And I've been going to pitch fest for a, (laughs) for a dozen years now. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I think there's, at, at certain at a certain point, once you're good enough, yeah, get out there. Absolutely, it's about knowing when you're good enough to get out there and having some sort of feedback, whether it's from a consultant or somebody in the know mm-hmm. who has some experience who could say, yeah, this is, you know, this is at least ready to get read by somebody and sent out there and and pitch it, go do. It's not perfect, but it's good enough and a good enough idea to really get somebody's attention. Uh, Mm -hmm. I just think most writers don't get that feedback and and don't have, don't wait for that. They just go. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go ahead and let's, um, let's talk. I've taken up a lot of your time. I do really (laughs) appreciate all your time, but let's talk about um, no bull script consulting for a minute. Just give us your, your elevator pitch on that. Yeah. uh, You know, obviously I come from the executive side, um, but I also have a degree in screenwriting and and write as well. And so I kind of uh, can approach, I approach scripts from both sides of the table. Uh, It's an executive point of view, um, but, you know, with, you know, with a writing background as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started the company basically because, I mean, I started it because I was really tired of looking for executive. I'm really honest about it. I didn't want to look for any more executive jobs. I was really tired of it. I was doing script consulting on the side freelance for Script Shark and a couple other places. Um, And I didn't love the way that other places were doing their notes or or working with their clients. And I kept hearing, like, you have to be nicer in your notes or they're not going to come back. And I went, well, that's not doing anybody any good. They're just going to come back with the same shitty script. And so I... um, You know, I launched this company. I didn't know it would work, but I knew that I had insight into story. I had good story instincts. I had my own way of doing notes um, that people seemed to respond to. And and it was something new and exciting and... uh, and why not? Uh, and mm-hmm. I was already. Can you tell us some sort of specifically about some of the services that you offer? Yeah, I have a number of different services from you know basic notes to to very in depth you know fifteen to twenty pages of in depth you know page notes and and everywhere in between. I do mm-hmm. query letters and everything comes with a log line. Um, I do a lot of phone consultations. I do some brainstorming uh, sessions if you have an idea or a first act consult if you're just not sure if it's on the right track. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it is notes, not coverage, which I think is always a big distinction that, that some people don't, um, make. Uh, but yeah, it, it is, they're all very constructive, um, very comprehensive notes, uh, on how to address all of the elements in your script that, that are working and great. And I like to mention those, of course, but then really focus on what needs to, uh, be fixed or changed or developed to kind of make the story more compelling or commercial or 
or the writing stronger. Um, and it really, I focus on whatever is wrong, whether it's character, concept, dialogue, er, everywhere in between. And certainly, mm-hmm. you know, um, the better the script, the more nitty gritty details we can actually get into once the story and concept and all the major things are there. But I have a number of different services. Um, they're not crazy expensive. I, my always thing was, I don't think your script should cost as much as your car. Like, <laughs> I, I couldn't fathom, you know, charging three thousand dollars to do notes on a script. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't think about that. But when I first moved to LA, I bought a motorcycle for a little over a hundred dollars, yeah. and I rode it for the first six months. Yeah, I, uh, so. yeah, I bought a little Nissan Sentra. It was like. Uh, and that was, and it was not much money. I think I racked up more in parking tickets than I spent on the car yeah, yeah. in the first few years. So let's talk a minute about your um, event. We've had um, Lee Jessup on the podcast yeah. a couple of months ago. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the event? I think you said it was July 19th in the Los Angeles area. Can you tell us about that event that you're doing with Lee? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, July 19th at the Westin LAX, which is down a uh, hotel near, near the airport. Um, Lee Jessup, uh, who's a career coach, uh, is a scrappy screenwriter, uh, and I are coming together for a one-day intensive uh, called Elevate Your Story, Elevate Your Career, um, and it's broken up into three sessions. I'm going to be doing different steps on elevating your story and script and concept and characters and, and all of that stuff, and, and even going through what elevating actually means. It's a nice buzzword that Hollywood uses. Um, and so I'm going to do uh, the session on kind of the craft, as we were saying, and, and story, and then Lee's going to go through... Uh, elevating your career, not just you know branding yourself, finding representation, how to actually make your you know hobby into a career and your career into a long-standing, long-term successful career. Um, mm-hmm. And then we're going to come together uh, and do a session on elevating your pitch. We will take live pitches from the people there uh, and critique them and and hopefully improve them and and do some some great pitch tips on how to elevate your different types of pitches uh, together. So it's going to be, it's like a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. thing. It's an all-day thing. Um, It's going to be really fun. It is not crazy expensive. It's on sale now until July 4th. Uh, It's $79 for the day, for the whole day, uh, for Mm -hmm. both of us. And, um, yeah, it's going to be a really exciting, fun event. Uh, I hope people can can make it and come out mm-hmm. uh and perfect perfect I'll, I'll link to it if you have yeah, a, a website link i'll link to it in the show notes and i'll link to um no bull script consulting as well in the show notes so um danny what's the best way for people to contact you if they just want to um follow you or or, or find out what you're up to or, or even just send you an email yeah i'm i'm super reachable um you know they can just email me it's daniel at no uh, if you ever have any questions uh, you can go to my site, which is obviously uh, just www.bullscript, uh, no bullscript dot net, um, and uh, and of course Twitter. Uh, I'm at Danny Manis. I get into a bunch of fun Twitter wars, but I also give a lot of good information uh, and and you know tips and resources and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, contact me, find me. Uh, you can find my book, No BS for Screenwriters, uh, at the Writer Store um, or through me. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm super reachable. So, yeah. Perfect. If people have questions they can or want some consulting, feel free. I'm, I'm here. Perfect, perfect. Well, Danny, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate your coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be running running another online class, writing a great second act for your screenplay. Many scripts die quickly in the second act, even after a very promising first act. Having a terrific second act is what separates the novice writers from the professionals. So if you're struggling with your second act, hopefully this class can help you. The live class will be Saturday, July 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. But if you can't make it to the live class, don't worry. I'll be recording it, and you can listen to it later on. In fact, all the classes that have been done through SYS Select are recorded and are available to SYS Select members to watch at any time they'd like. The two most recent classes are How to Make the Opening Pages of Your Screenplay Awesome and How to Write a Killer First Act for Your Screenplay. So this class on the second act is following along in that series. SYS Select members get access to all the old classes as well as the live classes each month to learn 
learn more about SYS Select, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. I also run a general screenwriting Q&A before each class. So if you have any screenwriting related questions, anything really, I'll be available to answer those questions before the class. Once again, I want to thank ScreenCraft for sponsoring this episode. They're currently accepting submissions for their comedy screenplay contest. They have a great lineup of judges, some of the best comedy producers in the business. The deadline for entry is August 1st. Check out ScreenCraft.org if you have a comedy screenplay you'd like to enter. In the next episode of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Gordy Hoffman. Gordy is a screenwriter of a film called Love, Liza, which won the Waldo Salt Screenwriting Award at Sundance in 2002. He also runs the Blue Cat Screenwriting Competition. Gordy is a true artist, and he drops a ton of really great information for screenwriters. It's a fantastic interview, so keep an eye out for that. In this week's writing words section, I like to highlight the fact that Danny has read literally thousands of screenplays. When it comes to becoming a better screenwriter, there are a few things that everyone agrees on. The first thing is to write a lot. I think everyone pretty much agrees that to be a better writer, you have to write a lot. But the second thing is to read a lot of scripts. Watching movies is good, but reading the script is better. Try and read a script per week. That's only like 15 pages per day, which really isn't all that difficult. I've been trying to do this myself, so I'm not above taking my own advice. It really doesn't matter what level you're at. You can still get better, and reading scripts is a great way to do that. As I said in the interview, I just finished reading Source Code. I thought the movie was okay, but the script is really excellent. So if you haven't read it, definitely check it out. And again, just watching the movie will not suffice. So start there if you're wondering what you should read. I posted a ton of scripts in the SYS script library, so check that out. It's at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. That's the show. Thanks for listening.